Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my deepest thanks to the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Affairs and to its dean, Greg Mancios, and to Paula Finn, who came down with the flu so she couldn't be here, the editor of New Labor Forum, uh, which, by the way, is a wonderful publication that, as Greg mentioned, I've been affiliated with since its inception. Uh, for organizing this event. Uh, thanks as well to the Newmark School of Journalism and the Sydney Hillman Foundation for agreeing to co-sponsor, uh, to uh, Henry Garrido for the terrific uh, introduction and uh, who I've known obviously for many years and to Alexandra Lescasi of the Hillman Foundation for agreeing to moderate the discussion that follows. As many of you have heard, I'll be leaving the New York area in just a few days on Tuesday, abandoning the city I have called home for most of my life where I grew up, the place where I was shaped professionally and politically, and will instead be relocating to Chicago, the hometown of my wife, who's a, uh, taken a new job as a professor of history at the University of Illinois, Chicago. At my age, and I just turned 75 a few weeks ago, that's called a major change. It's also the age when some of us start to try and make sense of things, to ascertain in the few years left to us whether we've managed to achieve some greater purpose and meaning to our lives beyond just progress for ourselves and our loved ones or whether we've drifted aimlessly in whatever direction the wind was blowing. Last summer, it occurred to me that the best way to figure out, while also saying goodbye to this city where I've had so many terrific memories, so many friends and colleagues, was with some farewell talks that would try to sum up some of the key lessons I've gleaned through countless battles, through chronicling the experiences and struggles of so many people I've encountered and interviewed while writing, I guess, about more than 4,000 articles and hosting close to 3,000 radio and TV shows, maybe to reveal in the process some incidents from the past that I've never had the opportunity to disclose, but which could provide insights to a younger generation who are still determined to practice good journalism, and still devoted to making a better world possible. As I mentioned in my first, the first of my talks at Columbia Journalism School a few weeks ago, mine has not been your typical journalism career. I've been grappling for more than 50 years, initially as an activist, then for decades as a journalist and a student of history, with the burning issue of how oppressed and marginalized people can best create and disseminate a narrative that truly reflects their lives, not just accepting the simple-minded, stereotypical, and often denigrating narratives of them fashioned by those with greater power and wealth, but instead offering a fuller and more accurate picture of who they are, of their passion and their pain, their achievements and failures, their hopes and their dreams. Given that the overwhelming majority of the people on this planet work for a living every day and that their labor produces the bounty all of us enjoy, I've been perpetually drawn to the struggles and concerns of working people. My insistence on this approach was not always welcomed by many of my colleagues in the commercial media who took to labeling me an advocacy journalist decades ago as if that was somehow a distinct and less developed form of, quote, real journalism, some outlier. A significant portion of my news coverage, though certainly not the majority, centered on working people in the labor movements, both in the United States and in Latin America. My ability to produce those stories successfully was directly tied to my own activism, to the networks of people that I came to know, many of whom are, are in this room, people who in turn provided me sources of information and unique perspectives about the inner workings of the labor movement. The simple fact is labor and working people are still central to modern society. 
The production, transportation, and distribution of goods and services remains the basis of all civilization. And no matter what nonsense you may hear from time to time about living in a post-industrial society, there are more industrial workers on our planet today than at any time in human history. It's just that the system of global imperialism has shifted the bulk of that, their production to Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and thus hides the bulk of them from the spotlight of the media system and the consciousness of those of us who live here in Western nations that voraciously consume their products. Some of my earliest memories of my father, who dropped out of school in the third grade to cut sugarcane in his native Puerto Rico and joined the US Army to fight in World War II, then migrated here to New York after the war, was how he would get up at 4 a.m. every morning in the 1950s to take a long subway ride on the A train from Euclid Avenue in our apartment in the Cypress Hills projects of East New York, all the way to Fordham Hill in the Bronx, then clock into his job by 6 a.m. as a kitchen worker at the Fordham Brighton cafeteria. My father also never missed a membership meeting of his union, Local 144. And he was appreciative throughout his life of the benefits union membership brought him. I figured to share some highlights of what I've learned after, uh, after with, through a series of photos and snapshots of some of my journalism, which I'll accompany with some narrative. Once I got to college, and you could move the, move the slide, the first slide, um, I was thrust into the Columbia student strike of 1968. There's a picture, I became, quickly became friends with leftist students like Mark Rudd, Dave Gilbert, and Lewis Cole of the Students for a Democratic Society. And that's a picture of a, a young me with uh, Mark Rudd uh, uh, at some rally at Columbia during the strike. It was my time in SDS that introduced me to Marx and Engels, Lenin and Gramsci, Rosa Luxemburg, and Franz Fanon, Kwame and Krumah, and other socialists and radicals. And I began to better understand how the more powerful within our society always seek to ostracize and dismiss the views of those they see as a threat. And that as a result, each of us must find our own way to knowledge. If you could move it to the next slide. A year later, I helped found the Young Lords organization in East Harlem, where I'd originally grown up. The Lords were a loud, brash, rebellious, talented group who sought to defend the Puerto Rican migrant community from systemic discrimination and to end our homeland's colonial status. For a few brief years, we became a thorn in the side of the establishment and the police in this town and in cities throughout the East Coast with our many occupations of institutions and militant actions against police abuse. And in the process, we inspired a generation of young Latinos to demand more equitable treatment. We focused not only on concrete bread and butter issues of more traditional community organizers, better schools, better healthcare, better city services, but we were also openly socialist and militantly internationalists, refusing to fight in the Vietnam War, inspired by the Cuban Revolution, seeking solidarity with the liberation wars against Western imperialism in Africa and Latin America. We not only created our own uh, newspaper, if you can forward it, Palante. There's an article I wrote in Palante back, I guess, in 1970. Uh, we also had our own weekly radio show on community radio station, WBAI. But even though we defended Latinos and people of color, we always stood for class solidarity. If you could advance it to the next one, that's, that's of course, Dolores Huerta, the great leader of the United Farm Workers. Around 1970, Dolores came to New York City trying to spread the, the great boycott of the California farm workers. And I, some of us in the Lords, we, we assigned some people to go help her out in, the, in uh, one of the picket lines that she was running at some supermarket. Years later, I, maybe 20 years later, I happened to be at a conference with the Lotus, 
And she said, oh, Juan, you and the young lords, you were so terrific. When we came to New York, you were one of the first groups that joined with us in our boycott. And I'll never forget what some of your members did. And I said, well, tell me, Dolores, because I never heard about it. <laughs> and she says that there were, they were, it was a group picketing outside one of the supermarkets, some supporters of the farm workers, some young lords, you know, came and got a quick read of what was happening. And they went into the, uh, the manager of the supermarket and said, you need to remove your grapes from this store. And when the supermarket manager told them to get out of his store, they proceeded to grab all of the grapes in the store and throw them out of the street. <laughs> right? And so the picket line ended quickly. <laughs> the work was already done. She said, and Dolores said, I'll never forget that, that the Lord's thought of doing that. We never imagined we could just throw the grapes out on the street. Uh, and um, so that was some of the activism that uh, the Lord's were famous for. Uh, of course, one of our most uh, iconic uh, battles was the battle at, uh, for Lincoln Hospital for better health services. And it already showed the dramatic um, uh sense that we had of the importance of labor. I don't know if it's, you're able to read our demands. This is the placard that Rishi Perez was holding up outside of Lincoln Hospital. No cutbacks in jobs or services in the emergency room or section K, number one. Number two, immediate funds to complete the building of and fully staffing the new Lincoln Hospital, which we wanted a new Lincoln Hospital. Number three, door-to-door -door preventative programs emphasizing nutrition, drug addiction, child, and senior citizen care. Number four, we want a permanent 24-hour complaint table at every hospital. <laughs> Number five, we want $140 a week minimum wage for all workers. Number six, we want a daycare center for the children of patients and workers and visitors at Lincoln Hospital. And number seven, we want total self-determination of, well, of all health services through community worker boards. Uh, those were our demands in 1970. Uh, and uh, so you can see that we, uh, from the very beginning, we understood the necessity to unite this, the, the fight of oppressed communities with the labor struggle. Uh, we then got very heavily involved in helping to assist worker organizing if, with a group called the Health Revolutionary Unity Movement, or HRUM, uh, very similar to the, to the drum movements that developed in the auto plants uh, in, uh, in the Midwest, the drum, uh, Dodge Revolutionary Unity Movement, LRUM. Uh, and we began to assist Black and Latino hospital workers to organize. Uh, in uh, various places. Now, at that time, there was already organization in the hospitals, and there was a pretty famous union involved there called 1199. Uh, and, uh, but unfortunately, some of the leaders of 1199, like Doris Turner, were not exactly uh, really responsive to their membership. So uh, we began building rank and file groups against the union leadership. We were called into a meeting by Leon Davis, the founder of 1199, and Mo Foner. Uh, and uh, they called myself and Felipe and Pablo Guzman into a meeting. And Leon Davis says to us, you're good kids, but you're dual unionists. You're creating problems in our union. <laughs> you got to stop this stuff. <laughs> and uh, we said, well, your union is not being responsive to uh, all of its members. and." Um, uh, Davis even offered us funds for our breakfast program and for our, our free, uh, free clothing program if we would desist <laughs> from creating internal divisions within the union. Uh, of course, we didn't, we didn't exceed. We continued to organize, and we eventually built something called the Workers' Federation uh, uh, in the Lords. As more and more of our members began working in different factories, we began to organize, this, in essence, rank-and-file groups. Of course, by the mid 70s, we in the Lords, like many uh, radical organizations, went into ultra left 
period. So some of it was the result of COINTELPRO, of, of, others of it was a result of our own immaturity. And so uh, we increasingly became doctrinaire, and uh, uh, this is an example. The, the Young Lords became something called the Puerto Rican Revolutionary Workers Organization. This is an example of one of their flyers, uh, one of the flyers of the group at the time. And we sent all of our, our, our members to work in factories throughout the East Coast and into uh, and into uh, in the mid in the Midwest. I ended up working at the L. W. Foster. Uh, factory in Philadelphia, in North Philadelphia, L.W. Foster. Uh, that's one of the labels from one of the bomber jackets they used to produce. They also produced men's clothing. And uh, and uh, uh, and so the, it was about 500 workers in the factory. Uh, about 400 of them were Latino, mostly Puerto Rican and Central American. And, uh, and there were some African-Americans and, of course, all the cutters. <laughs> downstairs in the first floor were uh, Jewish and Italian. Uh, and that was sort of the makeup of uh, the amalgamated clothing workers at the time. This was 1973. Uh, one of my first experiences uh, uh, as I was trying to organize, I would go to the union meetings in downtown Philadelphia. And at the time, the FARA strike had occurred in the Southwest and the entire amalgamated was launching a corporate campaign to boycott Farah pants. So I went down to the union hall and the, the one of the union leaders gives us all a bunch of buttons, boycott Farah pants, and asks us to sell the buttons to build consciousness about the importance of this strike happening in Texas and, and in the Southwest. So I go back to the factory. I start selling my buttons uh, to my fellow coworkers. And pretty soon, uh, the business agent of the Amalgamated comes by, a guy by the name of Eddie Davis, never forget his name. Eddie Davis, oh, nice suit. Uh, and uh, he came by and he said, what are you doing selling those buttons uh, in the factory? I said, what do you mean? I got them from the union headquarters. They, they asked me, they asked all of us to sell the buttons. He says, you can't be doing that without checking with me. Uh, and... Uh, Next thing I know, I get called down to the office by the manager of the factory. I'm hearing, I'm getting complaints that you're doing unauthorized activity and conducting unauthorized sales in the factory. I said, unauthorized sales? People are selling raffle tickets and, and, and numbers and all kinds of stuff is being sold in this factory on a daily basis. What do you mean I'm, I'm doing unauthorized activity? Uh, and uh, so she said, no, well, I heard it from the union guy himself, and you know you got to stop that. So I then had to challenge Eddie Davis about how I was paying union dues to be reported to the management <laughs> for something that the union leadership had asked me to do. Uh, and uh, so uh, Eddie Davis says to me, "Oh, I see. I'm going to have trouble with you." Uh, the next year, however, the amalgamated clothing workers went on their first national strike in 50 years. Right. Uh, and uh, and the uh, across the nation, all the garment factories went out on site. They hadn't had a national strike since 1922. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, Eddie Davis comes to me again because there were 400 Latinos in the in the plant, and most of them didn't speak English. So he needed me to help translate and be a, a strike captain uh, to get the Latino workers out. Uh, so I agreed to do it and there started getting involved a little bit more in the union. Uh, and uh, I eventually left there. And I left under circumstances of uh, having a confrontation with a Nazi. Okay, one of the foremen at the L.W. Foster Sportswear, a guy named Serge, who was Ukrainian uh, war criminal. He was actually under indictment at the time. Uh, the, the Ukrainian government was trying to extradite him from Philadelphia to go back to stand trial for the atrocities he had committed as a Nazi uh, during World War II. He was my boss, my direct boss. <laughs> right? uh, and because uh, I was in the press room, we were the pressers and pressed all the suits after the women sold them and the men would then press them on the machines. And he was a nasty, nasty guy, constantly uh, berating people, threatening to beat them up. And 
so on and so forth. And uh, of course, I wouldn't like take a lot of his stuff. And uh, so one day he started berating me again. And I turned to him. I said, look, Serge, because he had been he was a public figure. There were articles in the, the Inquirer all the time about the battle to extradite him. So everybody knew he was a Nazi. Uh, and uh, so <laughs> so I turned him and I told him, Look, Serge, you're not in Nazi Germany anymore. Okay, <laughs> this is America. <laughs> you can't talk to me this way. <laughs> so he said, "That's it. You're fired." <laughs> and uh, so I'm called down to the office by the plant manager again, um, Rose, very nice lady, uh, Jewish lady. And Rose says to me, "Juan, you're a nice kid. I like you, but Serge says if you stay, he's leaving." And he's too important to me, uh, uh, so you're going to have to go. So uh, uh, I lost my job. It's a uh, important experience. I moved on to a printing plant in Wayne, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, suburban Wayne advertisers, where, where I started work learning the press pressman's trade. Uh, it was a small plant run by two ultra right wing uh, publishers. The uh, these guys were so right wing that when Ronald Reagan ran for president, they were Republicans. They didn't back Reagan because he was too liberal. They backed Alexander Haig, who was also running in the primary that year for the Republican presidential nomination. That's how far to the right they were. Uh, and uh, uh, I was the first Latino they'd ever hired uh, at that place the week before the first African-American they'd ever hired <laughs> had been hired. And we were both in the, the press room together. And there was no union. Obviously, it was a small plant, about 10 people in the press room. Uh, and uh, uh, sooner or later, we started having troubles with the foreman, who was another nasty. I don't know, foreman, uh, I guess I hired because they're nasty. But uh, uh, so uh, uh, another nasty guy who was constantly berating the workers and for more uh, more production and threatening to kick their asses. And so one day he really got especially nasty. I had been out of uh, I had been. Uh, uh, I'd been absent that day, and I was told about how he'd acted and how he threatened that he was going to uh, uh, physically assault people if they didn't produce better. So I said, OK, that's it. We're all going up to talk to the owner. So I got all the people in the press room together and we went upstairs to the to the owner's office. This the brothers, the, the, the two right wing uh, supporters of Alexander Haig. And I said. Sir, I wasn't here yesterday, but I understand that Frank, the supervisor, was threatening to kick all of our asses. I have one question for you. Do I have to bring a knife or a gun to work to protect myself? If so let me know. I'll do that. But if not, you got to do something about Frank. Now, they knew that I was from North Philadelphia, and they sort of suspected I might be crazy. So... Uh, so the, the the owner immediately said, no, 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 calm down, Juan, calm down. We can handle this situation. And they there came, called in the, the foreman. They read him the riot act, and he was calm ever after. The lesson I learned from that is you don't really need a union. You don't need the organizational structure of a union. You need a group of people who can stick together and stand together, and you can, you can accomplish stuff. Uh, and... Uh, I went on from the Suburban and Wayne Times eventually to start working in journalism. And uh, that's when I started my career at the Philadelphia Daily News. One of the, the early articles I wrote uh, was a series of articles about cancer in Philadelphia, about cancer hotspots that had developed in particular areas of the city, which I was able to ascertain from getting a, a database of cancer deaths by zip code and age, race adjusting them and all that other stuff for, uh, with some experts. And it turned out that the, the neighborhoods that were had the highest cancer rate were those that had the highest uh, concentration of industries. Uh, South Philadelphia, which at the time had, was the home to about uh, two refineries within the city limits, an Arco refinery and a BP refinery, uh, and a neighborhood called Bridesburg in northeast Philadelphia, which was the center of the chemical industry. It had major, major plants of Roman Haas and Allied Chemical. And there had been stories previously about dozens and dozens of people dying 
uh, uh, who had worked in a particular section of the plant uh, because of their exposure uh, to the petrochemicals that the plant was producing. Uh, and I eventually was able to get in contact with some of the workers who were sick. And I remember one time one of the workers told me, because I said to him, look, you know, the safety records of this plant are not that bad. He says, well, the safety monitors only come during the day. Most of our toxic releases are at night. I says, I know, because I work the night shift, right? And uh, you wouldn't believe the stuff that we release uh, illegally at night. So I said, well, I gave him my phone number. I said, do me a favor. The next time there is an illegal release from the plant, will you call me no matter what time it is? Uh, and uh, so sure enough, about two months later, four o'clock in the morning, the phone rings. So I'm woken up in bed. And, and the guy who's on working that night says, Juan, they just released uh, a huge batch of phenol uh, into the air. And the, the entire neighborhood is covered with this stuff, not just the plant, the entire neighborhood. So I got into my car. I drove to Bridesburg, which is about 10 miles from my house. And as soon as I crossed I-95, because Bridesburg is on the other side of I-95, the rest of Philadelphia is on this side. As soon as I got underneath I-95, my nostrils opened up from the, the power of the chemicals. And there was literally a cloud covering the entire neighborhood. Here were all these people sleeping, unaware that the plant had just illegally released a whole bunch of toxic chemicals. No wonder people in Bridesburg were dying of cancer uh, at a much higher rate. So I wrote those stories eventually, uh, it created quite a stir. It caused eventually the state legislature to create a cancer registry to be able to track uh, uh, abnormal clusters of cancers in different neighborhoods throughout the state. Uh, and I saw that it was possible to make changes uh, then came that was uh, then came the Patco strike. <laughs> uh, I had the opportunity to cover the Patco strike. Those of you who are young really don't understand the enormous importance that the Patco strike had on the American labor movement. Uh, when Ronald Reagan ran for president in 1980, there were only two unions in America that backed him: the Teamsters and the professional air traffic controllers. The Teamsters backed him because they were still trying to get out of federal receivership and they thought they had a better chance with Reagan, a Reagan administration. And Patco, I'm not quite sure why they backed him, but he repaid them when Patco went out on strike by firing 13,000 people. The entire workforce that went out on strike, Reagan fired overnight. Uh, not only did he create enormous dislocation in our air traffic system, I wrote a series of articles about three plane crashes that occurred in the year after PATCO uh, workers were fired because of all the overworked or inexperienced traffic controllers that were in charge of our air system uh, in the years after uh, PATCO. So there was uh, the PATCO strike. Uh, I covered this. Uh, this was one of my uh, maybe third or fourth front page at the Daily News, the the, um, uh, the blue collar workers in the Philadelphia school systems going on strike uh, uh, for better wages. Uh, if you could move it on. Uh, this uh, was an article I wrote about a, a, a runaway plant, Eaton, uh, the Eaton plant. Uh, they were they were closing the plant in Philadelphia after, I don't know, 50 years and shipping all the jobs to, to Mexico. Uh, it was a period of where the maquila industry was growing uh, in Mexico. This was an article I wrote about a particular factory where the, the workers were being so uh, affected by the chemicals they were using that they were spitting up. Uh, black soot. Um, this is one of the few times I was ever sued <laughs> by an owner. Uh, it didn't go anywhere, the lawsuit. They sued me for defamation, and, uh, but it didn't go anywhere because I tried to reach them. They never got back to me, and, uh, uh, and uh, my paper supported me. Uh, and uh, then at the same time that I was writing these articles, I was participating actively in seeking to change the industry. In 1980, we created at the Philadelphia Daily News a third world caucus of the employees, which was all the black reporters and photographers and me, because <laughs> I was the only Latino reporter in the entire city at the time. Uh, and uh, 
And we, we developed the Third World Caucus demanding increases in minority hiring uh, 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 and, also, and also getting Blacks and Latinos into editor positions. Uh, the, uh, no, don't start yet. Um, also, this, this was the time when racial discrimination lawsuits were beginning to spread across the industry. The Washington Post had had a, a, a lawsuit. The New York Times had had a lawsuit, Rosario versus the New York Times. So we, our caucus invited Benildo Rosario, the lead plaintiff of the New York Times lawsuit, to come to Philadelphia to talk about uh, their lawsuit. Uh, as a result, one of the Black uh, uh, Newspaper Guild editors, uh, Helen Lowe, filed a racial discrimination suit herself. Uh, the company was dragging her through the courts, uh, her and her husband through the courts. They were running out of money. And so um, my, myself and a great, great journalist by the name of Chuck Stone, who I mentioned in my uh, Chuck Stone was one of the really great journalists in America. He was a uh, he was a Tuskegee Airman. He was a, a speech writer for Adam Clayton Powell when Adam Clayton Powell was in Congress. He was an editor of the Chicago Defender. Uh, he was the first uh, one of the founders and the first president of the National Association of Black Journalists. He was also a senior editor at the Daily News at the time and became my mentor. And um, so between Chuck and I, we convinced the union, the guild, to pick up the legal charges for the discrimination lawsuit that Helen Lowe had filed. And she eventually got a very, very good settlement. Uh, and uh, uh, the other, the other big thing that happened by this time, I was actively involved in um, still in Latino community groups. And in 1981, I was elected president of the National Congress of Puerto Rican Rights. It was a volunteer organization, uh, but my editor in chief hit the roof. <laughs> he said, I can't have you, you know, working for me during the day and then participating in uh, various uh, social causes at night or on weekends. And, uh, and I said, we can't have that. And I said, well, why not? You know, why not? I mean, we just had the Pope visit Philadelphia. You assigned Tom Cooney, one of the best writers at the paper, to write all the major stories on the Pope. Do you know that Tom Cooney is a member of the Holy Name Society of his church? He's not only a member, he's a leader of the Holy Name Society of his church. He is an active in Catholic church activities. You have no problem with him reporting on the Pope, but you have problems with me uh, getting elected to a position, and I don't even cover the Latino community. I was covering labor and environment at the time. So he said, well, you either resign or I'm going to have to let you go. So Chuck Stone luckily advised me. He said, check the union contract. So I did. And the newspaper guild had a provision in its contract that said that if a member of the guild had been elected to a public office or a office, an office of public responsibility, they could seek a leave of absence to come back and reclaim their job afterwards for up to four years. So they weren't, they were thinking like, you know, they were thinking like Congress or the presidency or mayor when they wrote that provision. So this had already been fought over many years before I became a reporter and a solution had been found. So I went into my editor and I said, okay, I'm requesting under this provision of the Gill contract a leave of absence for a year to serve out my term, and I expect to get my job back when I come back. And um, so uh, I was able to do that and continue uh, my work without being fired that time. 1985, we have a strike at the Philadelphia Daily News and Inquirer. Uh, both newspapers, about 4,000 people, everyone, the, the, the reporters, the uh, the pressmen, the drivers, the, the mailers, the electricians, everyone. It was, you know, craft unions. It's, craft unions are nightmares, but, you know, the craft union system is a nightmare. But we, everybody went out on strike. And uh, this guy, Bill Barry, the guy on the left, who was the head of the guild at the time, uh, asked me to be the co-chair of the strike committee. Uh, I had no idea what to do as co chair of strike committee, but I had experience with the Lord. So we organized a great strike. We put out our own strike newspaper. We, uh, uh, we, uh, we won that strike. It was five weeks that we were out. This is an article in the New York Times when the, uh, the strike was settled. We won 6% pay raise every year of the contract for three years, six, six, and six. 
That's not bad. <laughs> All right. Six, six, and six. We want a reduction of the pension, qualifying for the pension from 65 to 62. Okay. Now, I told you I'm 75. For the last 13 years, I've been receiving a monthly pension, a small one, but a monthly pension from a place that I worked for 30 years ago. <laughs> right. Right? That is the power of unions when they're able to win concrete benefits for their members. Uh, and now, admittedly, the pension is troubled, like all these pensions are troubled. They keep warning that they're going to reduce the benefits, but they still haven't done it. So who knows how, how long it'll last that I'll still get it. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, so at, shortly after that, I came back to New York, just around the time of the great crash of 1987, <laughs> well, a couple of months afterwards. And I started writing a, as a staff columnist at the New York Daily News. Uh, and if you can go on, I, uh, I, among the many, many articles that I wrote were th this one about the tugboat workers strike in New York uh, in 1988, there were, where the tugboat workers were out for 97 days, at least what I wrote. I think they stayed out longer, but they, they eventually won their strike. Uh, the, the first inklings of the Teamsters for Democratic Union and, and the efforts of the Teamsters to democratize their own union. Uh, you keep going. Uh, and uh, uh, I forget what this one was about, but keep going. This, uh, oh, this one was positive workforce. The Black and Latino workers who were demanding the uh, building trades open up open up uh, 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 construction jobs to black and, and Latino workers. Uh, you can keep going. Uh, oh, this is a, this was a great one. Uh, this was an article I wrote about the Korean Daily News, a newspaper in, the, in New York. At the time, there were three Korean language dailies in New York City, of which this was the biggest, 10,000 circulation a day. They had quite a significant labor force. And they had gone out on strike and the management had fired them all. Uh, and I knew at the time that the Daily News, the Tribune Company, was threatening to do the same thing. So I really wanted to get the article in as a way to raise the issue of replacement workers uh, uh, that, were, uh, that could possibly affect us. And sure, of course, within a, a, a week or two of my, that article coming out, uh, the New York Daily News strike of 1990-91 erupts a strike that lasted for five months, the longest newspaper strike in the history of New York City. And there are a couple of the strikers I see at least. I see Bill or I see Tom that are here. Any others? Oh, Maria. Maria's there too. Okay, we got at least three of the strikers uh, 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 that are here today. Uh, and um, the uh, Daily News strike was really a, a watershed moment for the labor movement. If you go on to the next one. Uh, it was a watershed movement in not only between management and labor and the city in general, but in terms of some of the creative tactics that we, the strikers, were able to put together uh, to win the fight. Uh, a good friend of mine at the time was Dennis Rivera, uh, who had just defeated Doris Turner. Uh, as the pr new president of 1199, who was still relatively young, but really was visionary and charismatic. And, and uh, so the day, the day after the strike erupted, and we were all lost because Tribune was vowing that it would either break the unions or, or close the paper. Those were the only two choices. And so uh, I went to talk to Dennis. I said, Dennis, you know, I got to come up with a plan. Uh, because um, we're having a big union meeting and and we need to have some kind of direction. And so Dennis helped me work out some I, some ideas. And then I came up with some of my own. And as a result of my having some kind of cogent perspective uh, on what we might need to do, uh, the president of the guild asked me to chair the strike committee because he'd already heard that I did a good job in the Philadelphia strike. Uh, so. Uh, so we had to come up with some creative solutions. One of the first thing I did, as soon as the president asked me to, to, uh, to chair the strike committee, is I said, I'll do it, but we need more money. Because uh, at the time, the union was offering $150 of strike pay if you picketed for four hours, right? That's the money that they had from the international union 
the International Union would offer $150 pay if you pick it for four hours. And I told him, Barry, we're not going to beat Tribune Company at a part time in a part time struggle. <laughs> we need a full time struggle. How much money does a local have? And it turned out the local had a lot of money. The local had like three, four million dollars. So I said, well, I want you to commit to double the strike pay from 150 to 300 if people are willing to work full time on the strike. Then we'll have more troops to organize and work. So he agreed. And so we were able to go from part-time strikers to full-time strikers. Uh, and so that was a key for, uh, part of the strike. The other part of the strike was the role that Dennis played with the rest of the labor movement. 1199 was at the time an independent union. It wasn't part of the AFL-CIO and was thinking of merging with either SEIU or RWDSU or one of the other unions. And so Dennis went into a meeting of the entire Central Labor Council. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, the entire executive committee of the Central Labor Council and the leaders of the Allied Printing Trades Union. And he asked them, uh, I forget who was that, was Dennis Hughes, maybe it was the head at the time. Or, and But Dennis Hughes was there and all, all of the big shots of the New York labor movement. And he said, I read in the Wall Street Journal that uh, the Tribune Company has already spent more than $40 million to defeat the workers at the Daily News. How much money do you all have to fight them? And they all looked at each other and, you know, like, and uh, they finally said, well, uh, the Allied Trades had like a few hundred thousand dollars in the bank. And then they said, well, you may as well give up now. There's no way you're going to do this without money. And here's my proposal. I propose that we ask, we have, there are 2 million union members in New York City. I propose that we raise $1 per every union member as a, as a financial uh, a treasure chest for the strike. And I'm ready right now, 1199 has 100,000 members. I'm ready to commit $100,000 of our union funds. What are the rest of you going to do? And they all hemmed and hawed and, oh, man, money? we got to give up money? And, uh, we can't just express solidarity? Uh, and so, uh, so uh, uh, now the problem is Dennis made that commitment. He'd never talked to his own union leadership about it, right? right? So then he had to go back to his own leadership. And I see Estella is here, so she probably knows about it. Uh, he had to go back to his own leadership. And they said to him, where, where are we going to get that $100,000? No. So he said, let's set up huge uh, buckets outside every hospital and begin a campaign of the workers themselves to chip in the money. And sure enough, they chipped in and they chipped in and they kept the campaign going. And because it re had reached so much uh, support, they got the money. Uh, and uh, and then the other unions were forced by embarrassment uh, to chip in. They never chipped in one per every member that they had, but they chipped in a considerable fund. And then the AFL-CIO came in with like 50000 So eventually we had a nice chunk of change uh, to be able to uh, prosecute the strike. Um, we also... Um, we also had to deal with a major issue, which was that the Tribune Company skillfully used the racial history of the Daily News to divide the workers and to divide the strikers from the community, right? Because uh, the Pressman's Union had 200 members. They were all white. Not only were they all white, they were all Irish. <laughs> they were all Irish. Uh, it was a club. And nobody could get in there. And the company knew that. Uh, so the company began appealing to the leaders in the black community, all the big, all the major ministers, Reverend Forbes at, at Riverside Church, uh, Reverend Butts at Abyssinian Baptist. And they called meetings with the ministers and the political leadership to say, these unions are racist. We guarantee you that if we break these unions, we're going to be able to hire many more African-Americans and Latinos. So this strike, breaking these unions is in your interest. That was a tough one. You know, luckily, there had already been racial battles within the union. The Newspaper Guild, five members of the Newspaper Guild, led by a great leader, Dave Hardy, 
had sued the Daily News in federal court and won the only racial discrimination lawsuit in the history of American newspapers that won $3.2 million a few years before the strike. And Hardy was a complete union uh, guild member and was, uh, was there for the strike from beginning to end. The drivers had also had a racial discrimination lawsuit and they had won their, uh, they had won their consent decree. So there were black and Latinos uh, uh, leaders supporting the strike in both of the major unions. So we were able to make the argument, yes, the pressmen are racist. There's no doubt about it. That's got to change. Uh, and, but we think they're, they've learned their lesson as a result of this strike, because we were all fired as soon as we went on strike. All 2,500 of us were immediately fired and replacement workers brought in. Uh, and then we were able to mobilize the rest of the public uh, community. Rev Reverend Jesse Jackson participated in several rallies, uh, uh, the uh, Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Many of the groups in the community rallied behind us, and we were able to defeat the company's attempt to divide the workers based on race. Um, the other thing we did was that we, um, we st started to pressure the advertisers to drop out. Uh, that that was tough, but we managed a great uh, a great uh, a great uh, tactic, which we called the shopping, where we would go to the major malls, uh, uh, and this was about a week or two before Thanksgiving, and all of the strikers would fill their carts up with uh, merchandise, and then go to the checkout counter and have everything checked out, and then say before they pull out their credit card, they would say. Are you still advertising in the Daily News? Oh, I don't want that stuff. And they'd walk out. And then the next person would rig it all up. And we created havoc in a few, in a few Macy's uh, and, and a few uh, stores that within a week of the first shopping and the week before Thanksgiving and Black Friday, a bunch of the advertisers all stopped advertising in the Daily News. Now, the Daily News eventually lost $400 million on this strike. Uh, and uh, uh, so we had tactics like that. We also, um, we also held a, a strike conference of the strikers. We held a conference of the strikers to plan a strategy for how we were going to attack the company. Uh, and, we, uh, uh, and we also took the strike beyond New York because the Tribune Company was a national company. And they had newspapers in Fort Lauderdale, the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel, the Orlando Sun Sentinel. And uh, as you all know, there's a lot of New York retirees in Florida, <laughs> a lot of them. In fact, there is an association of retired New York policemen. There's an association of retired New York teachers. There's an association of retired New York city workers. There's a federation of all the associations of all the retired New York workers, <laughs> right? So we went to them and we asked them all to cancel their subscriptions to the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel or the Orlando Sun Sentinel in protest against the Tribune Company. So the, the, com the combined pressure of all of these things, uh, we even put out our own strike newspaper and all of the right main writers at the paper were on strike. Some of the biggest names you know today in the media were in the strike. Marsha Kramer was at the Daily News. She was a striker. Uh, Adam Nagorny, the political writer at the New York Times, he was at the Daily News. He was a striker. Uh, and um, Joel Siegel, uh, who runs New York One, uh, uh, managing editor of New York One for many years, he was a striker. Gail Collins, columnist at the, at the New York Times, she was with us. She was a striker. Har Harvey Ariton the great sports writer. He was with us. He was a striker, although he left to go to the, to the Times. And one of the people who left was Mike McAlary, who was a friend of mine. Mac had questionable politics, but he was had a good heart. Uh, he won a Pulitzer Prize for the Abner Louima stuff. And Mike couldn't stand the idea of not being in the paper. So he jumped in the middle of the strike to go to work for the New York Post had a huge contract, million dollars over three years, huge contract to go to any. Uh, so I met with him after he'd made this decision. He felt guilty about it. And he says to me, Juan, I got to be in the paper. He says, I'm never going to cross a picket line, but I can't stay here if, 
if I have an opportunity to go to the Post and write for the Post, and I'll write all kinds of articles in favor of the strike. I said, Mike, that's good, but that's not good enough. Okay, you got this big contract? We need money. I want $1,000 a week out of your paycheck as long as we are on strike. I want $1,000 a week. Uh, and he gave it. He said, okay, his guilt was so big. I said, okay, we're not going to attack you. We're not going to publicly blast you. Just give us the money, right? Give us the money so we can have more resources to fight the strike. Uh, so, uh, so we ended up uh, five long months later uh, uh, winning the strike. Uh, we Tribune sold, uh, uh, sold the paper to Robert Maxwell, who negotiated a contract with us. And I want to like just share with you the column that I wrote the day we came back, right? Which was one of the most satisfying columns of my life, right? After being told that you're permanently gone, to be able to walk back in and get your job back, and the person who fired you is gone, right? right? For many of us, it was the longest winter of our lives. The country fought and won a war, but ours refused to end. The Persian Gulf War started and ended. Uh, uh, before our strike. <laughs> I mean, we started before the Persian Gulf War and we ended after the Persian Gulf War. Right? Uh, the history books will call it New York's longest newspaper strike. It will be written that the daily news strikers emerged as reluctant heroes who were drafted for a battle we did not seek that eventually took the hill. Yesterday, the fight ended as it began for the reporters, editors, and ad takers and office workers of the Newspaper Guild in an emotion-filled scene outside the News 42nd Street offices. During the five months of a strike which brought one of America's biggest newspapers to the edge of extinction, the 2,300 men and women in nine striking unions found a treasure chest of character. In the process, New York City discovered new working-class heroes. After all, throughout the 1980s, the stars were the rich and famous. They had names like Milken, Trump, Cosby, L Lorenzo, Iacocca. Television told this country's workers that their lives were boring, their labor too costly, their unions uh, the cause of economic decline. Too many began to believe those lies, as if New York's magnificent skyscrapers had been built by developers and not daredevil hard hats. It's fashion stitched by designers and not skilled seamstresses. Because of that, when we, pro we were provoked into a strike at the Daily News, few of us believed victory possible. The experts predicted the unions would be broken or that the Daily News would fold. They said the Chicago-based Trivium Company, owner of the news, was too rich and powerful. But then New York workers, the city's best uh, the uh, heart and soul responded by the thousands. They poured out into the streets and out of the subways to support uh, uh, to support us. The hospital workers, transit workers, hotel and construction workers stopped reading our paper. They helped us pressure news dealers and advertisers to boycott the very product we were seeking to save. Uh, and uh, so the column goes on, but it basically says, hey, all of your predictions and all of the expert stuff saying we couldn't win turned out not to be true. That we could fashion, uh, 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 oh, I, I forgot to mention, do you go on to the next one? Yeah, the boldest action we took of all was on January 2nd, uh, 2001. Uh, 10 of us occupied one of the daily news offices. Uh, and um, uh, because the, you know, spirits were flagging after Christmas and the holidays with no check and everyone was demoralized. So we needed something to galvanize people again. So we decided to see, take the daily news offices and uh, 10 of us were arrested. They came to be known as the tabloid tent. Uh, and uh, and here's a picture in the Times of the article. Uh, and uh, there's Lisette Alvarez, who I think is still working for the New York Times as a reporter. Uh, there's Lauren Draper. Um, uh, Gene Mustaine, uh, Lauren, uh, uh, Sammy Chittam, Maria, who's here, Fugit, Tanisha Grignoli, and Tom and Bill Farrell, who are both in the audience, were part of that Tabloid 10 group. Uh, it was uh, uh, 
I don't know if any of the others had been arrested before. I assured them it's not a big deal. <laughs> you, you get out. <laughs> you get out quickly, usually. And in, for this, in this case, even the police supported us, so we didn't even have to spend the time in jail. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, But uh, it galvanized. It galvanized uh, the, the strikers, and it made it clear to Tribune that we weren't going away. Uh, so that uh, you can go on. And then these are, uh, that was the column I just read to you. And go on to the next one. Oh, so shortly after that, we uh, started a rank and file group because our newspaper guild leadership was left out to be desired uh, and at the national level and at the local level. So we started a group called the Concerned Guild Members, a rank and file group within the newspaper guild. At one point, we had up to 40 percent of the votes in union uh, conventions. Um, our platform was simple. One, the guild had to merge with another union because it was too small to survive. And we we were we either pressed for it to merge with the CWA or, or with the uh, uh, ITU, but most people prefer the CWA. Uh, two, we were insistent that the Canadian locals of the guild have autonomy because you know a lot of the international unions have Canadian locals that are like subservient second-class citizens uh, to the American union. So we, we demanded autonomy for the Canadian members of the guild. And which gave us a big base of support among the Canadian chapters of the guild. Uh, and also, we uh, we sought greater diversity and leadership for women and people of color. Those were the three planks of our guild. Interestingly, we won all the battles and lost the war. <laughs> right? uh, the guild agreed to merge with the CWA, and it's now part of the news guild of the CWA. They agreed to grant autonomy to the can Canadian locals who, who probably decided to create their own union and left <laughs> the guild. And that took a lot of our rank and file support with it because we had uh, uh, and they, they eventually came up with a, a, a woman candidate for president, President Linda Foley, who we ended up supporting uh, and and uh, she won the presidency. So we never were able to fully transform the guild but we definitely had a big impact on its policies and, and change. Sometimes you don't win, but even when you don't win, you learn things uh, for the next time. Uh, and uh, so now you can keep going. And then I, from that point on, when I came back to the news, I had a lot more freedom because you know, even, even the bosses were afraid of me. So I was able to travel a lot. Uh, and I, I started working, uh, going throughout Latin America, through Mexico to the Maquilas, if you can keep going to the others. Uh, this is a, this is a, a, an article I wrote in the Dominican Republic about uh, a, a general strike at the Dominican Republic, which happened to be the 14th general strike in the Dominican Republic in the, in the previous five years. 14 general strikes in one country in five years. Think of that. Uh, think what kind of a labor movement that is. Uh, and uh, uh, here's an article I did on the, the, uh, the union of the Maquila workers in San Pedro de Macorí, where there were about... Um, uh, 98 factories employing 40,000 uh, people, mostly young women. Their, their, their union was one man. I interviewed him. One man, an elderly man, in a union hall, maybe this big, but really it was a shanty house, uh, who had no equipment. He had a telephone that he kept locked up in his desk because he didn't want all his union members to be calling the United States in his time. Uh, and uh, and uh, at a fax machine where he would send his protests to the labor ministry of the Dominican Republic about the abuses of the workers. Uh, he had nothing. And he was the leader of 40,000 uh, workers. Right. Uh, and yet and they were able to organize themselves. And it always I always t when I think of all the union leaders who spend all this outrageous money on dinners and hotels and, and and car services and all this stuff. And I think of people in these countries that have nothing to organize their union members and still manage to do it. It shows you the, the, the vast differences between the movements. And you can keep going with some of the others. So I did a lot of stuff on free trade when the free trade treaty was uh, uh, was going on. Keep going. Uh, and uh, there's the rail workers when they were, were on strike. Uh, uh, oh, this was a favorite of mine. Uh, 40, this was a, a more about personal perseverance. This was a story about an elevator operator named Julio Morales, who worked for 47 years uh, operating the VIP 
elevator at the Waldorf Astoria, and he was about to retire. Julio Morales had met every president since, uh, I think, D uh, Dwight Eisenhower, had met all these world leaders because he would, he would bring them up and down in the VIP elevator uh, at the Waldorf Astoria. He never missed a day of work in his 47 years. And so his workers honored him uh, when he retired. He also happened to be the father of Iris Morales, who was a member and one of the key leaders of the Young Lords. That's how I learned about the story. And I was talking to Iris one day. She says, you know, my father's about to retire, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so because of that, I ended up writing the story of this one man and this incredible record and all the people that he'd met <laughs> and all the stories that he had about all these great uh, world leaders in the elevator. Uh, and uh, uh, there's our workers' comp, uh, cuts the workers' comp. Uh, uh, this is the first story ever written about the Taxi Workers Alliance uh, and, and their first strike uh, that they uh, that uh, uh, that they were organized. Of course, Taxi Workers Alliance now become very famous. Uh, uh, and this was an interview I did with John Sweeney when uh, when he was president of the AFL-CIO and. Uh, Keep, keep going. Uh, this was an uh, article on the general strike in Puerto Rico opposing the, the privatization of the telephone company in Puerto Rico uh, that occurred. Uh, and, uh, and this was uh, the, the building trades under Brian McLaughlin having the protest of 30, 40,000 people down in Midtown Manhattan. Keep going. Uh, this was when uh, Andy Stein resigned and and uh, Anna Berger took over at SEIU uh, and uh, keep going. Uh, this one, I don't even remember what that is. Keep going. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, this is about the Postal Service, the government's attempt to, you know, to privatize the Postal Service and <laughs> get rid of postal workers. Uh, this is a lawsuit of uh, uh, workers at the Central Park uh, a Central Park restaurant claiming sexual harassment and uh, uh, by the owners. And uh, uh, this is uh, immigrant workers trying to recoup their uh, wages that they were stiffed on by their bosses. Uh, and uh, this is the Verizon strike and from Democracy Now! that we covered that. Uh, keep going. Uh, this is the Chicago Teachers Union strike, uh, uh, the, the famous strike uh, during the Rahm Emanuel period. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is the first article written on the the first strike on uh, for the fight for fifteen by fast food workers. Uh, so these are these are some of the articles that I managed to do over the years. But but largely largely dealt. Uh, I'm looking for my end here. Oh, I don't have my end. So I'm going to have to call it up from here because this is the lessons. What are the lessons learned from all this, right? So let me see if I can call it up quickly. Sorry about that. Okay. There's. Back in here. Yeah, here it is. Okay, hopefully it's here. Okay, so what are the main lessons from all of this? that I take away and that I hope some of you will chew on. When workers organize, they can improve their lives immeasurably. And while you don't always win, you always gain greater consciousness of what it takes to win. To achieve great change, you must defend your principles, but always be flexible and be willing to admit you are fallible. You must be willing at key moments to take extraordinary chances, sometimes to risk everything, whether that means being arrested, losing your job, being ostracized and attacked by friends and even family, but you can always come back. Right? To win a labor struggle against a powerful employer requires hard work, 
It requires daring tactics and deep systematic analysis of the weaknesses of your opponent. It requires that you shape your own narrative. And most important, it requires unity, not only among your fellow workers, but with the broader public. And finally, we must never forget that we live in an imperialist state, one whose prosperity has been built on the labor of tens of millions in what we used to call the third world, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Countries whose people labor in qualitatively worse conditions than we are in the West. In fact, a small but significant sector of our own working class benefit directly from the crumbs of imperialism. Defense industry workers, for example, those who do the work of managing and tracking the revenues and profits of the empire. And this labor aristocracy is permanently lost and has historically become the basis for right-wing fascist movements. Our success against those forces is possible only if we are aware of and support the marginalized sectors of our society and the people of Asia, Africa, and Latin America who are at the front lines of the fight to make a better world possible. So those are the main lessons I've learned in the past 50 years. Uh, I hope you'll consider them and hope that can inform the work that you continue to do. We're now going to go to audience questions. We'll be alternating uh, between questions uh, from our Zoom audience and our in-person audience. If, for those in person, um, feel free to just raise your hand. We'll bring you the mic. Um, but we'll get started with some moderator questions and with some Zoom questions, and and we'll go to folks here as well. So mic is working. Yeah, great. Um, I'm Alexander Lascaz with the Sydney Hillman Foundation. I'm so pleased to be here with you, Juan. Thank you so much for your talk. Mm -hmm. um, so you told us so many wonderful stories of the past. Um, one of the first questions that came in is, could you describe more about how you would contrast the radical labor activism of the 70s with that of today? Well, I, I think the... Uh... It was a different time because obviously a lot of the uh, labor radicalism of the 70s came out of the plants, uh, you know, the uh, the auto the auto industry, the meatpacking industry, uh, the um, uh, and many of those plants have left. They've gone. They've gone other other places. I mentioned to the students uh, earlier that I spoke to um, General Motors has about 700,000 workers in the United States. It has 700,000 workers in Mexico, uh, and uh, they're, they're producing pretty much the same uh, uh, auto parts and the same cars and assembling them only in Mexico. They're paid $10 a day, uh, and, uh, you know, roughly speaking, while in the United States, they're paid $30 an hour plus benefits. So uh, the shift of production means that the impulse to rebel uh, in radical ways is less in the United States, I think, than, than it has been. in, uh, And also that the employers have learned, except in the case of Amazon, that the bigger your plant, the more problems you're going to have with your workers, right? So they always try to build small plants or keep them separated so that they, they, don't, in, they, they don't engender class solidarity. And so I think that there is, a you know, the fact that Starbucks uh, I think what Starbucks workers are doing is great, but the, the organizing of Starbucks workers will not change syst systemically our country. We've got to get to the workers that are at the height, the center uh, of um, uh, of our system. Uh, and um, so I think that the, that the part of the problem is where the organizing is happening uh, and um, uh, the Amazon workers, I think, is a real big step forward because if you can, if you can organize more and more of the distribution system, that's what it is. It's the distribution system of capitalism that Amazon represents. I think the the more chance you have to have impact on the society as a whole. 
Um, I'll take one more from the uh, Zoom and then um, get your questions ready. Um, local newspapers are rare. They've been taken over by conglomerates with no interest in local news. Um, what issues do you see with the decline of these papers? Well, there's no local news anymore. Right? It's as simple as that. You Most people do not know what happens in their local school board, their local uh, zoning board, their local city council, because no one is reporting it. In fact, uh, even state legislatures, it used to be that all major newspapers had a, a raft of reporters assigned to the state capitals. That doesn't happen anymore. I mean, uh, Jimmy Breslin had had a great line once in a column he wrote. He said, I got on the train to Albany today with all the other people who go there every day to steal. Uh, and uh, and that's what happens in these state legislatures. So much happens that is not covered because the media do not assign people to do it. They don't have the economic resources within their existing models to provide good paying jobs for people to do that. So we're, we're starved on local news. There will always be national media companies that will give you national news as distorted as it is. But who is holding the local power system accountable in your town, in your city? That's a big, big, that's the big question problem of, of informed citizenry right now. Okay. Um, hello. I really, really need to know if your boss, the Nazi, was extradited. I'm sorry. I, I, she needs I, to know if your uh, boss, the Nazi, was extradited. Oh yeah, yeah. He was eventually extradited. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, but after I after I left. <laughs> hey. Okay. We have a lot of really specific questions. Um, I tried to get the general ones first, but. Um, uh, well, here's another one. What lessons did you learn from your young Lord experience that you think is important for activists to understand today? Well, I think um, a few. One is um, uh, be bold uh, uh, and be daring. Um, two is that the Lord's got very much into occupations. Now, I learned occupations as a tactic that went at the during the Columbia strike, but we and the Lords really refined it uh, into into doing op occupations without getting people hurt, right? And uh, and being able to maximize the the um, uh, the narrative value of these occupations. What were the issues involved? What were the uh, uh, what 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 was a cause? So we were very good at getting out the issues involved. Uh, so, um, and that's why when we did the occupation of the Daily News building, I, I'd already done like, I don't know, 12, 14 occupations by then. Uh, so it was nothing new. It was just a question of how we could get it done. So I think boldness, uh, and the thing about an occupation of a plant or a school building or a public square is that you get the chance to create a liberated space within a class society and there's uh i know the people who, i know exactly how the people who occupy wall street felt i know exactly how the people in the seattle world trade center protests uh, felt when you occupy public space and you turn it into something new you get a sense of the potential of human beings to change society and even if you are defeated and even if you are evicted you carry that lesson with you for the rest of your life. Uh, and uh, so I think that that's the main thing I learned from the Lords is uh, uh, boldness. Uh, uh, don't be afraid to occupy spaces. And also, very important, stick together. The progressive movement is always very good at splitting up. It's, uh, it's very hard to stay together. Uh, and you have to figure out ways to resolve your differences to keep as large a group as possible together. And uh, so I think those are the main lessons I learned from the Lawrence. Is there another question? Let, let's go to another Zoom question. But if there are folks here with questions, please keep your hand up and we'll get two or three in a row from the room. 
Okay, great. Um, there's one about Patco. Um, the question is, uh, besides the resulting plane crashes, it sounded like you were going to describe the impact of Reagan's Patco firings on the labor movement. My sense as a rank and file organizer at the time was that it greatly intimidated and dampened union activism. Was that what you saw? Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, uh, all you got to do is do it do a Labor Department chart of strikes in the United States, a number of strikes of major uh, uh, of major size in the United States over the years. And you'll see that in the aftermath of PATCO, strikes became much less, uh, much less frequent in the United States. Uh, and uh, because uh, Reagan took a dramatic action, a radical action. He said, we're going to fire all of you <laughs> uh, and uh, if you dare to strike against us. And so I think that that uh, definitely dampened uh, the labor movement, that the government itself could stand so clearly uh, against workers uh, was some, a lesson that um, uh, uh, that stuck for years. Yeah, there's actually a documentary coming out about PATCO, so uh, keep your eyes out for that. Um, arbitration has been forced on the rail unions just recently. Can you flesh out the background and significance for us? Is there any hope for the rail workers after the administration's Ronald Reagan moment? Well, I think that the rail workers um, definitely caught the nation's attention, which I think is, again, it's important. And, and my sense is that the the public sentiment was largely in their favor for you know, even some of the commercial media were largely in their favor. Uh, and uh, so in that sense, the fact that they raised uh, the possibility of a national strike and that they and uh, that they, in essence, the federal government was forced to take a stand uh, is uh, it is a. Uh, is definitely a uh, gives an indication of the power the labor still has, uh, and uh, I also covered the transit strike, New York transit strike, which is a similar situation. Although, although they went against, look what happened to the transit workers when they dared to go against uh, the uh, the ban the Taylor law. Uh, they were basically fined up the gazoo for years uh, as a result of that strike. Uh, at the same time, the three day strike of the transit workers union really was a watershed moment here in New York City. Uh, and so, I mean, the transit workers, transportation workers are a key uh, part of our society, you know, and, and especially in the period of just-in-time production, which is what all of capitalism is right now. The transit workers and transportation workers have much more power than they had in the past, because in the past, employers would stock up their warehouses before a strike to be able to weather through it. And now with just in time production, they don't have any inventory. So that's why they get so rabid about preventing these kinds of strikes. So I think the workers have more power. Eventually, a leadership will come in that will take the risk uh, of, of calling a strike, and I'm sure we'll get will get crushed uh, economically in terms of fines and uh, and and other things. But I think it helped to raise consciousness among other workers that, hey, it's not imp impossible to consider a strike, uh, a national strike. Um, can you um, explain what you mean by worker or maybe more importantly, who's not a worker? I've never actually understood this. I've never been, I've never worked where I was called a worker. <laughs> oh, uh, that's a good question because obviously our economy has changed so dramatically over, over the years. Uh, basically, I mean, you're still a worker if you depend on uh, your labor for your sustenance on a daily on a daily basis. You know, I think that's the key aspect. If you don't own, uh, if you uh, if you're not an owner uh, of any kind of form of production or distribution, that uh, you could be a small owner, but you're not necessarily a worker. And and I believe that this is part of the 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 
the misconception that the media have focused on uh, that Donald Trump is supported by the working class. I don't believe that's true. I think that it is a small owner class. Uh, it is franchisers. It is small business people. It is uh, people maybe not educated, but who have aspirations or a vision of being capitalists. They're just not big capitalists. They're small capitalists. And the social base of the MAGA movement is really uh uh, uh, small uh, business people and, as I said before, the labor aristocracy uh, and the labor aristocracy, the defense workers, when you think of, we are the largest merchant of death in the world in terms of the number of weapons that we we manufacture. And we're not manufacturing those in Vietnam or Indonesia. We're, we're doing the the, the consumer goods there, <laughs> right? All of the weapons are being built here in factories here in Boeing and General Dynamics and and, uh, uh, and and all of these weapons manufacturers and the surveillance equipment and the drones and all of the military hardware is being built here. And I believe that many of those workers, unfortunately, have bought into the necessity for uh, this kind of production. And so I see them as a labor aristocracy, the, the defense industry workers and the small business people uh, uh, across the world who dream of being a rogue capitalist like Trump. <laughs> I think we've got one over here. Oh, so you talked about how for the the left needs to be organized. Well, not organized, but have more unity because there's a tendency for the left to engage in like splitting sectarian beefs, and you know that really resonates with me. Um, because it's almost like relationships, right? Every great relationship is based on repair and direct communication. And I was wondering if, um. But it just seems so hard to do that. Have you seen any ex uh, in your own personal experiences of like previous leftist groups or just sectarian beefs being like healed up in the face of like a greater struggle or a greater enemy? Well, for instance, in the Daily News strike, we had a we had like I said, we were on strike. Half the newspaper guild crossed the lines. Right. There were there were nine unions. No, no, there were no one in the driver's union scab, no one in the pressman scab, no one in the mailer scab. Half of our 700 members crossed the line uh, and uh, we had to decide how to deal with them uh, afterwards. Uh, and it was very difficult decision. Uh, first of all, it was a difficult decision attempting to convince them not to cross the line because they were white collar workers who didn't know that anything about the labor movement and, and were scared to death. They had families They you know, they, uh, they were not imbued with labor consciousness. Uh, and, uh, and and a lot of them were friends of ours. So when they crossed the lines, there were those in the guild afterwards who insisted on putting them all on trial. Right. And we did because there was a provision in the union contract that if anyone crossed the line, they could be fined uh, one day's pay for every day that they crossed the line. Uh, and we actually had it was like it was like Nuremberg. We had trials of scabs that went on for months. You know, and I was always opposed to that. I thought that, oh, yes, they did scab. But, you know, I've been around long enough to know that some people have bad days, some people have bad weeks, some people have bad decades, you know, and uh, you always uh, leave the op the, uh, the possibility of people learning from their mistakes and changing. Uh, and so you 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 should lean more in the in the direction of amnesty <laughs> than you would of uh, uh, persecution or, or, uh, or prosecution. So that created a lot of divisions. And I think it hurt the ability of uh, the union afterwards to stay strong and stay together. Uh, and uh, but I think generally speaking, uh, we're we're increasingly raised to think as individuals. We glorify individualism. I mean, I've often told um, uh, uh, Amy and I think Amy's here and some of the people at Democracy Now uh, that uh, democracy itself, the bourgeois democracy, elevates individualism 
uh, and uh, it's think of the rights of the individual, the, you know, how is the individual being affected, not how is the society or the social group being affected, and, uh, and the need to subsume your individual desires and your individual beliefs to a greater group. Uh, and so democracy itself has problems. It doesn't always necessarily equate with social justice. Uh, and what do you do in that situation? How do you resolve that conflict? Uh, I'll never forget the the Algerian example when Algeria had an election where Islamists came to power in a democratic election. And what did the Algerian government do? It crushed them. Uh, it uh, it destroyed the illegally elected Islamist government with the support of France and all the European powers, because at that point, democracy was inconvenient. You know, uh, the, the capitalist class will always promote democracy and individual uh, voting because they don't think it's a threat. They think they can control it. The moment that a really radical or revolutionary government is anywhere close to an electoral victory in this country, you will see an attack like you have never imagined. And I give you the perfect example that happened when the, the day that Bernie Sanders looked like he was about to win the Democratic presidency, overnight, every single candidate dropped out and backed Joe Biden. And I am absolutely sure that when the history is written, we will know that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and the entire Democratic Party establishment called those people up and said, it's time to get out <laughs> because we're not going to allow uh, Bernie Sanders to uh, uh, to be the Democratic nominee. So democracy is trumpeted and promoted as long as there is not a real threat to capitalism. And once that happens, all, all bets are off. Uh, and I think that uh, it's important to understand that that's what we're dealing with. Another one over here. Oh, hi. Um, Juan, I noticed you spoke about industrial unionism and you had some concerns about what's going on with uh, Starbucks and Amazon. Um, I'm a nurse in the New York State Nurse Association and our radical caucus did take over our union 10 years ago. Um, and uh, you didn't talk about healthcare because it's a slightly different thing. We're dealing with an industry that is being privatized. At the same time, our union is fighting for single payer, very lonely in that fight. Um, and we, you have, as I speak, 17,000 nurses are taking strike votes. Uh, I do believe certainly in my hospital in the Bronx, we will be going out in January, 3,000 of us, but not, um, but really about a more social compact, how our patients in the Bronx are being treated by these mega systems that are, you know, developing this two-tier system. Do you see any power existing in that kind of construct where we have this sort of social justice piece attacking industry, defending against privatization, looking at the bigger picture? Is that, do you see power in that? Yeah, well, I think that the, the whole, um, I mean, the healthcare industry, uh, it's a nightmare. It's a complete nightmare what is happening uh, in America. And I, you know, I, I've been for the last six years in New Brunswick. Uh, and so I've been face to face and I've had my students investigating the RWJ Barnabas, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas healthcare system, which is one of the two, two monopoly systems uh, in New Jersey that control basically most of the hospitals in New Jersey. It's either RWJ Barnabas or Hackensack Meridian. They're the two giant chains. All of these hospitals have become these enormous chains uh, and they all benefit from tax exemption. They all benefit from the fact that they pay no property taxes and yet they are all multi-billion dollar businesses uh, and, and their doctors operate their private businesses off the hospital grounds. But, you know, you, you know, whenever you go to a doctor, no doctor gives you a diagnosis. They all send you for tests. You got to take this test. You got to take that test. You got to take this test. That's all pro for profit operations and all those tests. Uh, so the hospitals have become this like octopus of of um, of profit 
uh, under the guise of being nonprofit for the most part. We're not even talking about the for-profit industry, the nonprofit industry. RWJ Barnabas alone, last time I looked at their 990, has 24 executives making a million dollars a year or more, including their chief executive making six million dollars a year or more. And these are all nonprofit operations. <laughs> That's a great nonprofit gig. <laughs> uh, then uh, you got all these people, uh, millionaires off of basically government insurance for the most part. That's what it is. Uh, and uh, so I think that uh, the healthcare system, uh, I think is, is a poster child for how capitalism is destroying our society. And, uh, uh, and it's unfortunate that so many of the politicians don't want to like take it apart and re remake it. Over here, Michael. Okay. Hola. <laughs> Juan, gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Um, your presentation reawakened a lot of memories, um, especially the daily news strike. And yes, I just want to make a comment on that. It was for those of us in the rank and file of the union organizers was the most extraordinary experience, how we were able to build solidarity and I remember that march we did across 42nd Street. Um, thank you for bringing that back. I just wanted also to share something else that your columns become, became also for some rank and file workers, a voice that they didn't have. And the struggle I remember most clearly is the fight for democracy against a gentleman that maybe a lot of people here don't remember the name. His name was Gos Bobona the president of 32 BJ. I guess the gray heads in here remember who Gus Bobona is. If not, Google the name and you will see. And that was an extraordinary contribution that you did to provide a voice for those workers that were being spied in the democratic movement within the union by Bobona paid uh, for investigators. And also on behalf, and I don't know if there are any Dominicans over here, your coverage of those strikes, that strike that year in the Dominican Republic uh, made you a hero, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, a compañero, a camarada to one of us in the Dominican community. I'm sorry to see you leaving New York, but maybe you will come back. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think some of us in the, your old friends in the back are trying to figure out how the heck we're gonna go to Chicago, but it will have to be in the summer, <laughs> Angel, because I am going to Chicago in the winter. Gracias, compañero. Gracias. And, and, and thanks to Estela, who's really one of the great uh, unsung heroes of the labor movement in, uh, uh, in, uh, in New York City. And, and uh, she practically ran Mount Sinai Hospital, I don't know for how many years, as an 1199 uh, person there. Uh, and uh, but thank you. You want to take one more, this sure. this yeah. gentleman, and then I and I have one final one. Okay, we'll take two quick ones. Okay. Chris, thanks for everything you've done. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, please stop by the People's Church and thank Ray for all the work he's done before you go to Chicago. Uh, there have been two significant legislative measures recently enacted in New York that can be considered victories for labor. Hernandez versus New York awarded farm workers the right to organize, and more recently, app-based restaurant delivery workers have been awarded protections and improvements to wages and conditions. Those campaigns have largely been driven by working people from other countries and worker centers, but NIDA has produced a first contract. How do you think these two campaigns will help combat the exploitation of working people under the current system? Well, I think the campaigns are, are definitely positive and and uh, uh, but what you're mentioning me before about getting a contract, that's the big that's the big difficulty because many employers uh, recognize a union, but then uh, delay doing a contract uh and uh and that could sometimes take years uh so that i think that um uh we've got to be able to somehow or other maybe pass some legislation or sign requiring a minimum amount of time <laughs> for these contracts to be to be negotiated because it, it's meaningless it's you know what's 
what did uh, Martin Luther King say? Justice deferred is justice denied. You know, if you keep deferring the actual implementation and agreement on a contract, and we're having it right here at at, at, at the Rutgers at Rutgers University with the university right now, uh, our people have been negotiating a contract for six months, and they 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 can't get the management to make clear offers because they want to wear you down. They want to drag it out. Uh, and uh, because they know that as they do that, the labor force changes, the excitement changes, the uh, the desire changes. So um, uh, so I think that it's, it's critical to uh, do something legislatively to force these employers to uh, be able to um, come to an agreement within a, uh, a uh, respectable amount of time. Okay. I feel lucky. Is it on? I feel lucky to be hearing these stories. Uh, I never heard of any of these, so I'm learning a lot today. But I wanted to ask a question about um, creating narrative, um, specifically labor narrative. So what's going on in the UK labor movement right now seems really important to me because in the span of six months, they've been able to turn the approval rating of the strikers and they can't even get anybody on a BBC interview to be for the government and not for the unions. And I'm wondering if the U.S. has would, would allow space like that, like the UC strike and the new school strike seems like the management couldn't get their narrative out there and it was fought and the L.A. Times were on the side of the UC strikers. So if that came to the supply chain unions, let's say in the US, do you think there would be um, even room for that here? I think there is there is room for it. It's a question of whether the labor movement itself could get its act together sufficiently to be able to, uh, to uh, move quickly when these things occur to create narratives and get them out there uh, and uh, basically organize the media. Uh, which is what we used to do in the Young Lords. We believed that it was important not only to put out our own narrative, but to make inroads among the media to be able to get them to uh, to provide a more accurate uh, a picture. Uh, and on the labor movement, some of you know 